This is gonna be bro awesome. This thing's gonna shoot all the way up to Europa and bring us back a couple of Europa being lobsters to grill up. <laughs> all right, three, two, one. Final stages. The subject became erratic, violent, and really funny to watch. Hello, and welcome to the IMMP cast, the Intermillennium Media Project.net. It's dot com. <laughs> I'm Ian Porter. And I'm Matthew Porter. He's my dad, I'm his son. And I've taken over the show once more. The Millennial Strikes Back. Yes, the Millennial has struck back. But I did so because we had an amazing time last time. Sometimes I strike back because <laughs> you've shown me something that I need to cleanse myself of. This time, I wanted to do something fun in return because last time, for our 100th episode, we had an amazing time talking about Gigantor. We did have a lot of fun, and thanks to everybody who came out to see us at Nondiscon. That was a great show. Absolutely. I, I loved getting to hear about the animation that was so important to you when you were growing up, and how weird it was, and also fun and kind of err, and therefore something everything else references. Yeah, it, it was weird. It was very entertaining to me at the time. And it was influential in ways that would not have been expected. Exactly. And because it was all of that for you, I wanted to share with you the thing that was that for me. And that also means I get to take us to a brand new media, a brand new source of entertainment that we've not covered on the podcast yet. Welcome, Dad. To the world of flash internet videos. <laughs> We're talking about hamster dance, finally. <laughs> oh no. Oh no, what have I unleashed? No, no. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I am talking about probably the most iconic uh, series, I would say, about of flash cartoons ever. Honestly, if you wanted to have a character that represented this medium for the era, I kind of think it's one of the characters from this website. That is HomestarRunner.com. I think you're probably right about that. So a lot of the times when you're showing me something for the podcast, you get to talk about the first time you encountered it. When you first saw it, when you first got to experience this. And I've got a version of that for Homestar Runner. Oh, I don't know this. Yeah. So a lot of my uh, classmates in middle school had already been watching these cartoons for a little while. They were on the bandwagon earlier than I was. And I wound up learning about the site during computer lab in middle school. And it was right near the beginning of our Thanksgiving break. And so I've got this little bit of something I saw that was weird and confusing and the teacher was not very happy that i was on the site because it was all this flash cartoons making noise and they wanted me to finish my class work which i'd already done and it was a whole thing but i remember searching up the site not because i knew the name but because i knew all these little references sitting in the living room on the family computer on thanksgiving day and finding the website again, and just binging episodes after episode. <laughs> and then, when I got my own laptop later on, the same one that I went Darko mode for Donnie Darko on, I sat and watched every single cartoon on that website eventually. So that by the time I was, meh, I was in high school, like, you know, junior in high school, I had every single episode that had come out. <laughs> memorized <laughs> me and my friend tony would just throw quotes back and forth all the time and you told me about this probably back around that time and i dipped into it i've watched some of it but i i did not immerse myself in it the way you did but that's the thing it's i i it it grabbed me early and it was something that could very much immerse me because it had this weird perfect mix Homestar Runner wasn't just videos, 
they were also interactive. You clicked on things and you got bonuses. There were Easter eggs peppered throughout. And sadly, that part has gone away. You can't pick up the Easter eggs in the way you can you used to anymore because Flash is gone. And a lot of what I'm showing you is the uploads, official and unofficial, to YouTube that are trying to preserve this, con this content. It converted this hybrid medium that was a video presentation but had this interactivity, converted it into flat video, which is a, a good thing that they did that because it, was, it preserved it. But it would be great if there was some way to convert them, convert them all to HTML5 or something. Preserve some of that interactivity because it really is a big part of what made them unique, what made them what they are. Yeah. And in some ways, this is a chance to get to, to mention the fact that we've lost something of that. But it's also fun to share these with you because this series had a weird effect on me. When you're staring at something hunting for all these little things, the mannerisms and phrases and way that it decides to be very smart while doing very stupid things <laughs> leeches into your psyche. And there is parts of how I now talk and think that I unfortunately know have been shaped a little by HomestarRunner.com. Or fortunately. I definitely think that there is a category of entertainment or all kinds of media that is stupid things for smart people. Yes! And this, this I would say, it takes a lot of intelligence to be stupid this well. Yes. As well as these cartoons are made. And and they'll they will rapidly shift from doing like the obvious joke you see coming to suddenly pivoting into a reference you didn't expect. <laughs> like all of these characters have a remarkably large vocabulary with which they describe what they're doing and how <laughs> bad an idea it is. If I can draw one comparison, and I'm sure it's not the last comparison I'm going to draw, but it seems to me that this played a role for your youth in a similar way to what Monty Python did in mine. Very much so. It was the weird, absurdist humor that was, was rewatchable in a way such that there, you had a tribe of fellow fans who, you could, who always knew your references and would be able to respond to any lines that you offered. And, and it was that stupid absurdism for by and for smart people. Yes, that is exactly the right kind of comparison. There is a lot of sim. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> okay. It was, it was the same thing. It was uh, by, by the end of junior high, I had every episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus memorized. And so did most of my friends. Exactly. Okay. Well, for the sake of this, I'm not, I didn't decide to throw 200 episodes of Strong Bad Emails <laughs> and a good DVD collection worth of other shorts and such they've made at you. I kind of narrowed it down to a list, but all of these have either a quote that I always think about or a reference I can make or little things like that. And so I wanted to I wanted to kind of use this as a, a sampler platter of the Homestar Runner experience. Yeah, so I, I took that list of links that you provided, and I've gone through these as well. Mm -hmm. Watched or rewatched these. And so I want to talk about some of the ones I sent you, but that's also because these ones are going to be able to give me hooks to talk about other things related to Homestar Runner. Great. And the first one is probably the one I've watched the most ever, which is Caffeine. <laughs> the Homestar uh, Runner Strong Bad Email Caffeine. And for anyone who doesn't know what, uh, anything about the Homestar Runner website, the main character it's named after Homestar Runner is weirdly and acknowledged in the world of the show, not the character who has the most videos. That's actually the bad guy, air quotes, Strong Bad. A masked Mexican wrestler who is actually less competent of a guy than he wants to present himself as, who answers fan emails. There's another formula that you get in uh, 
in comedy, the the formula of the idiot who thinks he's a genius and the genius who thinks he's an idiot. You get that in some things that we haven't watched yet, but probably will, like Laurel and Hardy. Mm-hmm. I think you've got some of that in in uh, Homestar and Strongbed. Strongbed's the idiot who thinks he's a genius. Oh, absolutely. And Homestar is the the character with a certain kind of genius. Yeah. Who he and everyone he doesn't care whether he's a genius or not. Everybody else assumes he's an idiot, but he's clearly not. Exactly. And that there's a lot of fun and they've got a whole wide range of other characters to fill in interactions with these two mains and pair them up and see how these all chemically react in that sense. <laughs> but absolutely strong bad thinks he's a genius. He is not as smart as he <laughs> thinks he is. He's not absolutely he's not dumb. He's just not smart in the ways he thinks he's smart. That's a good point. He is he is clever, he is witty. He is not accomplished in all the ways he wants the world to acknowledge that he is accomplished. Right. And Caffeine is this weird, wonderful little example because it is him doing his normal kind of crazy stuff. And it gives you a sample of all the other characters as well. Because what Strong Bad does is he decides to caffeinate his younger brother, Strong Sad, the depressed and esoteric kind of character. Very existential. Yeah. I think, I think Strong Bad reads too much uh, Jean Paul Sartre. But song, strong Sad? Yeah, I think so Strong Sad reads too much Sartre. Yes, honestly, I love Strong Sad. He's one of my favorite characters. <laughs> but him being caffeinated in this experiment for the science fair results in some of the weirdest interactions across the world of free country USA <laughs> and some of my favorite quotes. And kids at home, uh, dosing someone with any kind of substance without their knowledge and consent is wrong and evil and don't do it. And Strong Bad was wrong to do this. Correct. Made for a really funny cartoon, though. Absolutely. The subject became violent, erratic, <laughs> and really funny to watch, yes. as it's said in the cartoon. <laughs> Which is also my favorite description of BattleBots. Uh, <laughs> but there's just something about this, like, weird, energetic character that, this, that Strong Sad becomes, which is completely out of character for him. But I love it. And this is a great way to show all the different characters we've got. We've got the giant older brother, Strong Mad, who's just this <laughs> perpetually yelling brick. We've got this pseudo-lackey, pseudo-pet, the cheat, who helps out Strong Bad and kind of winds up the butt of jokes or the only competent guy in the room <laughs> at the same time. We've got um, Coach Z, who is kind of a punching bag even to Coach Z about everything. <laughs> We've got a lot, of, a lot of odd and fun characters here. Marzipan, the only girl in the entire story, who is the arts and crafts one, but also kind of harsh. <laughs> There's a, but this gives you a chance it shows you all the different characters and it it results in in things like the uh, entire wood davers soliloquy which i can remember <laughs> word for word it's not like the caffeine makes strong sad more focused or capable it just makes him weirdly manic and verbal and i can't remember my legs yes <laughs> I feel great. I feel great. I feel great. I feel bad. I don't even watch football. I don't even watch football. <laughs> like, what? You get the feeling that this is what's going on in his head all the time, and all it did was turn off the part that analyzes it before it comes out his mouth. Yes, I think that's right. And I relate so hard to that. <laughs> but there's some times when, like, I'll be there, like, getting a cup of coffee in the morning, and the thought that goes through my head is, and collect the ensuing data. And I'm like... <laughs> I, I feel like I'm doing that to myself, and I'm acknowledging that. But that's already become, like, wired in as, like, a call and response. Caffeine <laughs> equals this. <laughs> Automatically, in my brain. But once I'd had you seen, see that video and get an idea of the, the world and characters this is in, to some extent. And as weird as caffeine is... 
it has a storyline. It does. It it starts out with the the recommendation or the suggestion from a somebody who emails Strongbed, but it has a beginning and a middle and an end, and it goes somewhere. It's got almost a three act structure in this tiny cartoon. Yeah, that's the thing. There's a lot of really good. This is an earlier video on HomestarRunner.com. But you can already see they've got a lot of great ability. The brothers chaps, the makers of these cartoons, have a lot of great video skills in terms of how they they structure stuff, how they animate stuff, how they depict their little cartoon world. It's not complex yet, and it's never needing to be. When it If it doesn't have to be complex, it's not. But it's always well done. And they, they demonstrate enough of a grasp of the elements of story that I am totally willing to follow them when they break those or twist them or throw them aside. Mm-hmm. Which they occasionally do. Which they do. Kind of in the next one, they kind of do by literally introducing an interruption as the joke and, and story. Yes, this is a, it has a first act and then a bunch of weirdness. And then a bunch of weirdness. And then sort of a another act. Yeah. It's just like the... Act two has nothing to do with anything else. Yes, because the next one is one of my other favorite of their cartoons, Drive Through. This is purely a standalone little cartoon about, I guess, a normal day in their lives. But it starts out with this whole thing about trying to send a rocket to Europa. <laughs> and I grew up with the kind of rocket that he's using with the air pump. Yes. And the little plastic, red and white plastic rocket. And of course, the little thing isn't going to go as high as he wants. So they pull out the compressor, <laughs> which I so want to get a sticker that says that for my actual air compressor in the garage. <laughs> but just that, that's another example. The way they like to mess with language is addictive. Yes. And that's something else that occurs to me. I if, if, Can I go off on a tangent a little bit? Go off on a tangent. One of my favorite series of stories, one of my favorite writers, is P.G. Woodhouse. And you're familiar with P.G. Woodhouse. Yes. Because we've read you a whole lot of Jeeves and Worcester and Reggie Pepper stories on long family car trips. As a matter of interest, what are you doing? I, I merely ask. I'm sorting through these clothes. Uh, uh, these are for repair and these for discarding. Oh, wait a second. This white mess jacket is brand new. I assume it had got into your wardrobe by mistake, sir, or else that it had been placed there by your enemies. I will have you know, Jeeves, that I bought this in Cannes. And wore it, sir? Uh, every night at the casino. Beautiful women used to try and catch my eye. Presumably they thought you were a waiter, so... And it's some... One of the... There are elements of Jeeves and Worcester that I've recognized in other things. There's a TV series called Letter Kenny. Yeah! Which... It has a few really great seasons. It really falls apart and the wheels come off and I don't know what happened to the writing, but it's not nearly as good in later seasons. But for a few seasons there, Letter Kenny, it was amazing and it I took me a while to realize it was tickling the same parts of my brain as PG Woodhouse. Even though Letter Kenny is about this town in rural Ontario with the Hicks versus the Skids versus the Townies and it still had this, it was a defined place with its own rules that you could quickly get a sense of, even just intuitively. And this stylized use of language that was just the way people talk in this fable-like environment. It's like the PG Woodhouse world. Maybe if you'd ever been in a real fight, you might not be so keen for another. What'd you say? You heard me. Tarps off, boys. <laughs> you looking for a Tilly, buddy? Let's have a Donnybrook! Pump the brakes. You take your shirt off but leave your sunglasses on. What sort of backwards pageantry is that? You gonna fight with those shades or play PokerStars.com? That's what Homestar Runner is like. Yes! The, everyone here has a lot of language knowledge. These are... That's one of those things where it's, it's, it's dumb things for smart people in that sense. It's... These characters are weirdly verbose at times they have a thousand ways to describe anything <laughs> and they will choose the one that is 
the right kind of ridiculous for the moment. If something needs an emphasis, they don't have only one way to emphasize. They've got a million and they'll pick one. Oh, ho, ho, ho. devilish to have. Dear Justin, in addition to the cut of your jib, I like the sound of your town, Murfreesboro. But we got the all-wide science fair just around the corner, and I've been straining for a project. So far, all I've come up with is the effects of gasoline on fire. Right. It's, yeah, they don't just choose what's the funny way to say this. It's what's what is the way that eventually builds to something funnier than it could have been otherwise. And also, there's a whole lot of fun with language in other ways, which lightens up with the second half of the cartoon drive through <laughs> where in the middle of this giant story with this entire other little setup they've done, they run into m- one of my other favorite characters in the weirdest ways, the drive through whale. <laughs> <laughs> that is a character who shows up again, isn't it? That's the thing. Anything they reference once is in their back pocket forever. Even if it's a passing joke in a single episode, they love to throw it back in later or elaborate next time. You never know what's going to be a callback. And that means watching all of them, there are things where if I saw it out of order, I'd go back and say, oh my goodness, this is not the first time they've this has been here. <laughs> I'm going to tangent myself for a moment and mention another podcast, one that I love and I've been listening to since they started, which is called Come On Fahugua Pods. It is a podcast by a bunch of people who are watching through every single thing Homestar Runner has made, everything on the Homestar Runner website, everything the Brothers Traps have made in chronological order. And the the fact that in their own show, a running joke became that comes back <laughs> is so telling. But the drive through whale being a character in that sense, when he's really kind of the setup and punchline of an entire one video, he didn't have to return ever. But they were able to just milk a joke about not being able to understand what's coming out of a crackly drive through speaker so well. <laughs> 917, sever your leg, please, sir. Could you repeat that? I thought you just asked me to sever my leg. Sever your leg, please. It's the greatest day. And there are times when I'll be waiting in the line at a drive through now, and I'll just think to myself, sever your leg, please. It's the greatest day. And I'll crack <laughs> myself up without a context. And I am, I am delighted by the fact that that is in my head as like an almost instant endorphin button. And I am terrified for anybody in the car with me who doesn't also know this website, (laughs) who is just going to turn and look at me like I'm crazy. (laughs) (laughs) But this is what this has done to me. All these episodes, all 200 of these strong bad emails, all of their other stuff, every single one probably has a little thing rattling in the back of my brain somewhere and speaking of it comes back yes at the end of drive through yes he mentions jeeves he does doesn't he (laughs) yes when they're somewhere else and strong bad is ordering food for um, on top of a box or something for him and the cheat he actually says like thanks jeeves or whatever imaginary thing is serving him yeah so they kind of know the references we're pointing out they're similar to. <laughs> yes. They are they're culturally aware in that own sense. That's one of the other things. They're not a bubble. You also don't know what they're going to pull in from elsewhere. Are they going to make reference to history in the oddest ways? Are they going to make reference to old TV show tropes of any kind? Are they going to make reference to to music be that rap or hair metal or country or whatever you like once i also had wikipedia there was a lot of wonderful times when i wouldn't know what in the world homestarrunner.com just referenced and i'd wind up taking a half hour and doing independent research and learning something new and it only took me until about college to realize dang it they made me study it's educational yeah. For, for kids. For kids. Like our next episode. <laughs> which, in our whirlwind tour of my favorite characters, 
has one of my other favorite characters in it. But this one's also important because it's a cartoon show. People think cartoon shows are for kids. This episode is directly saying it's not. <laughs> they directly call that out. Th this is not supposed to be a TV cartoon show. Now, ironically enough, the Brothers Chaps have worked on TV cartoon shows since then. Actually, one of them was a major part of writing for the show Gravity Falls. I can see that working. So they've they've gotten into a lot of other stuff and worked on like major Disney projects like that. But Four Kids is a weird one, kind of a hard one to sit through. I kind of wanted to know what you thought of this one. I I enjoyed that because it really it is one of the ones that achieves that Monty Python level of quick cut absurdity. Yes. A quick cut absurdity. It still has some kind of a path you can look back on to see where how it got where it is. Exactly. And and they have fun going through an entire like different types of children's programming. The crayon drawings art style for one of them. The the PBS style like polish to the second. Yes. And my one of my my other favorite characters, we've kind of hit the three. Strong Sad, the drive through whale. And Hamsar. Hamsar? Hamsar. The, the strange little background character who speaks in, like, strange tangential sentences. I'm not gonna lie to you. That's a healthy piece of real estate. Because when they're making an NPR joke, he doesn't say that. He says, I'm a trendy tote bag. <laughs> and if you know NPR gives out tote bags for, for members, you're like, wait a minute. He's directly calling this out. He gets to make commentary <laughs> at a 90 degree angle to the rest of the world. And yet he's this weird little homunculus kind of thing based sort of on Homestar. Yeah, he's he was literally like built around a typo of the main <laughs> character, was given character form and then became their commentary engine. <laughs> and I love him. He's this he's this little physics breaking gremlin that kind of proves the world is aware of itself in this more so than all the fourth wall aware characters do. And after, um, after Strong Bad demonstrates that he does not have the temperament to host a TV kids show. Oh no! He suggests that a Homestar, that a Homestar do it. Yeah, and he does a little too well. It almost kind of works. It does. Also, that that song is now embedded in your brain, Dad. I apologize. That I can count to three. Yes, <laughs> you can now. Everyone can now. In a, in a world that has things like uh, Blue's Clues and uh, Dora the Explorer, no, no shade on them, I can kind of believe that the Homsar TV show could have been real. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have been confused if, what do, what do you know, Hattie Man actually was <laughs> being on the TV while I flipped through channels. It wouldn't have phased me. And that shows, like, when they do a parody, they do a parody that is simultaneously distinctly on their website and in their style, but also a clean enough mimicry of the thing they're parodying that you don't flinch at its depiction of it. They do, a, they kind of avoid that uncanny valley of referential. That's one of the. One of the main rules of good parody, I think, is that the parody has to be strong enough to stand up on its own feet, not just be goofy jokes about whatever it's parodying. Yeah, there's always a bit of respect or even love at whatever they're making fun of. Yes, you have to know it well enough to parody it well, and you're not going to know it well enough if you have no knowledge or you're not going to know it well enough if you have no interest or respect for it. Yeah, you've got to care to comedy. And so we move into, after talking about their design ethos, we, will, we, we go into redesign. <laughs> I'm loving our transitions here, by the way. We're doing a good job on that. But redesign is fun because redesign absolutely throws me as a person who, who has a bunch of design textbooks upstairs, who studied some of this stuff in school. 
and the way they summarized things and played with it <laughs> is embedded in my brain. <laughs> Once again, a little too close to reality. <laughs> yes. The number of times I thought when I'm there learning Photoshop, the phrase, now to dip it in plexiglass, to give it that children under three are sure to choke on it goodness, <laughs> was another one of those like, this phrase is too deep in my mind now. <laughs> But it's so accurate for that look that things are trying to achieve. The ones that come to my mind more often are Color Wheel Roulette and Almost Forgot the Fangs. Yes! <laughs> I'll be creating a PowerPoint for some presentation. I'll be like, Almost Forgot the Fangs. <laughs> exactly. And they just spring from this design he's making, fully formed. But they also have fun with other things. They're making jokes on Ray Harryhausen-style claymation when he makes his wall a green screen. <laughs> because that's the point of, what, like, what are you supposed to do with a green screen? You're supposed to fight giant claymation creatures. <laughs> and that means they took the time to animate an entire claymation counterpart to their Flash cartoon character. That for that great. one scene. And I'm like, that is dedication. <laughs> And they're also aware enough and making fun of the medium they standardly work in, where when they notice our main character's eyes are green, they throw in a, and please give me back my sight <laughs> joke. Because, like, I watched that and never realized his eyes had been green screened out until they made that punchline. I had to stop watching that. I was laughing too hard to keep going when he got to the end. Please give me back my sight. It's like, oh, yes. wait. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I'm waiting. His eyes look like the background behind him. It's odd. <laughs> Like, that's an instance where they really do care about the art of it all, and they are artists. This just happens to be their medium here, is this flash cartoon of comedy. But you can see, like, that same sort of dedication and that same thing, and that is inspiring to me. Like, what, like, when I was younger, this was funny. When I was older, this was still funny. When I'm now... It's funny and inspiring. It's gotten to this extra level where it's like watching this is motivating me because I'm like, oh, wow, I could do I can do something. I could do something. Yeah, let me let me take this energy that this is giving me and go with it. Let's make something out of this. And I and but the next one is one of my other favorites here as well, because you want to talk about parodying something so accurately. It's the Blubbo's commercial. <laughs> Because this one takes that drive through whale from before, and years later, they made an entire commercial for the company. <laughs> and this one is another one that will go through my head all the time. The number of times when I'll be like, the isosceles fish sandwich. Wait, we have a fish sandwich? I will lose it every time. <laughs> and I like, like getting a fish sandwich from Arby's sometimes. They make a good one, but it's like, that's become the phrase for it in my brain because it, Homestar Runner does that to you. But it's another rapid fire series of jokes, but they, instead of moving from parody to parody, like they have in some of these other ones, this is a long form of a single parody taking all the jokes they can make within it. I, I'm not sure if this... I know that you'd watched some. I didn't know if this is one of the ones you'd seen before. I had not seen this one before. Okay, you hadn't seen the the uh, the Blubbo's commercial. No. But uh, the, the isosceles fish sandwich got me. Yes. And the... Just, just some of the... The weird jokes with the people in mascot costumes and... <laughs> Their, their, their special, like, crossover burger with the, there's a lot of side characters in Homestar Runner that are callbacks, kind of like the whale was. They took a character they made for a single joke about a rap star and turned him into the celebrity that this other background character is doing a crossover promotion with <laughs> in the middle of their, their video. So as much as I enjoyed these, there's so much that I didn't get out of them because I do not know all of the possible references just internally to uh, Homestar Runner. Yeah. So like every time for every outside reference it makes, it, there's also an internal reference, I'd say. And so the idea that there is a rap star named PCP with a peace sign 
<laughs> and uh, apostrophe Y. And like he's doing a crossover limited time burger with a a fast food chain is exactly the sort of thing you'd expect to see. <laughs> yes. And they are able to just take the concept they've put elsewhere and smash them together to make this this commentary version that is completely internally consistent. It's taking something totally believable and uh, potentially normal and putting it in this bizarre environment with these people. And by doing so, they kind of point out how absurd those things are. Like when when your world is populated with, you know, masked wrestle men and armless white you know, super sprinters and things like that, you're like, "Wait a minute, that's weird too." Yeah, we 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 see it in the Homestar world and think this is just weird and eventually we start to think is it is it any less weird out in the world we live in? Yeah. The commentary kind of sneaks up on you. But a lot of this that we're talking about homestarrunner.com, we have not actually talked about the character of Homestar Runner. Our counterpart to uh Strong Bad and the the title character of the entire website. So the episode Four Branches is a great way to introduce you to who the character is. It's honestly on my list of, if you've never seen anything Homestar Runner before, it's kind of a great one to throw to, throw to someone. It is a good jumping in point. Yeah. Because this is, uh, this is Strong Bad describing the stupidest things Homestar has done. And I, and I, I want to know what your favorite of the four was. <sighs> I need to refresh my memory as to what they were. Uh, let's see. The four things are there's uh, doing stupid stuff on his TV show, doing stupid stuff at the office, doing something so stupid it's smart again, and doing something <laughs> stupid in a mascot costume. I think it's the doing something so stupid it's smart again. Yes. Because it ties into that whole idea. Absolutely. Because he... like. <laughs> We watch him, like, when asked 2 plus 2, recite Coulomb's Law perfectly, (laughs) (laughs) with this little, like, noise in the background going on, which, I'll be very honest, that's one of the things I kind of think whenever I do our bit on the show here, of Ian does the math. That little (laughs) calculator sound that pops up behind him is a little bit of what goes through my own head. (laughs) That makes a lot of sense now. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's... It's stupid in that he is failing to provide an answer to a simple question. And yet the answer, the wrong answer that he provides shows that he is in bizarrely knowledgeable about mathematics. Yeah, he's just not, he, he, he can't literally put two plus two together, <laughs> yes. even though he's smart enough to have this entire other formula memorized. <laughs> Although at the same time, there is an internally consistent logic. Homestar Runner's world is never one where 2 plus 2 equals fish is funny. But 2 plus 2, oh, I know that, it's 22, is funny, because <laughs> there's an internal logic. You can always see how the characters got from point A to point B. It's just never the right way to get there. And the entire of that one ends with uh, the the last of his of the four vignettes here ends with them tr- smoothly transitioning into a parody of old black and white cartoons with an entire other art style and an entire musical number, which will get caught in my head plenty. <laughs> but that's a part that we haven't touched on. They make a lot of music. They do. There is at the start of every single... Uh, strong bad email he sings a little song of some form or does some little skit just a little poem or something you get the impression the character's doing this to amuse himself yes but that is as much hearing them think up song bits as anything else they've made like three different bands out of them and uh, <laughs> the, the brothers chaps have made like three different bands with their friends doing this They've worked with groups like They Might Be Giants, and they'll put songs in the middle of their things. You'll never know when you're going to get this remarkably catchy tune. Oh, some of them are very catchy. Absolutely. And that's my transition into our next one, which is one of their music videos. 
done in one of their completely other art styles, but it's one of the songs I love and will sing to myself plenty or put on in the background. I have it in my favorites list on Spotify. And that is Fisheye Lens. That is a jam. That is a brilliant jam. It is honestly a really good, clean rap song about the stylistic choices of making a rap video. Yes, it's about getting a fisheye lens and making a rap video. Yeah. And it goes into, it's one of these things that where the lyrics are just narrating themselves and the video, and yet it all works. To reference another group that does something similar, there is something very on the same wavelength as to what the Homestar Runner rap videos and other music videos were doing and what the band The Lonely Island makes. Yes. Where, like, I can see those, like, those two things are of this same self-aware in their own music kind of style. And just like a good parody, playing it straight is so important to making it work. One thing I do like about the fact that these videos are now on YouTube instead of being on the Flash site is that you're no longer watching them in isolation. When you went onto the Flash site back in the day, you'd load up the video and wait for the long loading time and everything else that Flash had, and you'd watch this video, but you'd had a black screen all around it, and you were just on this website watching. Now that they've uploaded some of their stuff to YouTube, there's comments underneath. And you're saying the comments are a benefit, a net positive? Yes, because it's exciting to see other people note and be excited with you on these things. Well, that's cool. That's how comments should work. They should work. too often don't, but... I have... There are places where I've seen comments go awry. A lot of the Homestar Runner videos, I see comments being amazingly nice. Maybe that's just the ones I've seen. But watching people say, oh my goodness... Coach Z actually dropped some hot bars there <laughs> in the middle of fisheye lens. And I'm like, that is accurate and weird. And I'm excited that I could read you feeling that excitement. <laughs> Let's pretend I got 10 girlfriends and make a Benz in my Benz with my fisheye lens. It's like, that's good. Oh my God. That goodness. is hot stuff. That is hot. And, and this is from the punching bag joke character in so many of their other things. They give lines. That's smooth, too. I'm like, oh, wow. They kind of love every character they make, even if they're making a character to be the butt of a joke. I like the fact that the whole video, this whole cartoon starts with Coach Z waking up Strong Bad because it's been too long since the people have had, I forget how he phrased it, but... The what? <laughs> the purple. The purple. Purple. <laughs> Because Coach Z is a speech impediment. Like, half the characters have some form of speech impediment. Let's just be very honest. Yes. But yeah, the, it's been too long since the purple have had a... a dope, I forget how he put it. A, a dope a, a, jam. A number, one, a number one jam. They're scraping dope rhymes off the kitchen floor just <laughs> to survive. Yes, that's it. In his thick Minnesotan kind of accent. <laughs> and, and the fun thing is like you talk about you never never know when the callback is going to be there's an animation of a spatula going under the word <laughs> dope rhymes and pulling it off of linoleum <laughs> later in the animated music video <laughs> so it's like this is canonically the start to their rap song but it's also like the setup as to why they're making a rap song which is another one of those like flexible time comic styling kind of thing they do yeah because strong bad was, was happy to help out if you can get your hands on a fisheye lens exactly <laughs> and f but i'm g the last one i showed you is actually p kind of a lead into our ending questions because mm -hmm. there's one issue with me taking over this episode for homestar runner and that's the fact that it's not over they might have slowed down what they make, but they're still making stuff. Even after Flash died, they've moved to YouTube and uploaded later things to YouTube. They've uploaded YouTube-exclusive things now. Their website still works. They've got it fixed with a, a Flash alternative and everything. But the last one I wanted to show you, the next April Fool's thing, is actually much more recent. Ah. Oh. That video came out uh, four years ago. 
But that's well after the site had gone relatively dormant Mm -hmm. and after they'd started uploading stuff to YouTube as a preservation technique. This one is as much a a cry of we can still keep making these as anything else. It's a it's don't count us out the video. And I think it's just as fun as their older stuff. Because this one starts out with actually an animated recording of one of their kids. I was going to ask, that's one of their kids? Yes. R- narrating what he thinks they should do in a cartoon. Yep, and believe- this sounds like it's maybe a three-year-old? Yeah, I, th- I, I, forget, I forget which one of them, but it's their daughter like just talking out. They've grown up with, this kid has grown up with these characters. <laughs> and he's just talking out a little kid's story about the characters. And they animated it and used that as this very long lead in to a hidden strong bad email episode. It's a little bit like an X cop kind of thing. Yes. To start. Very much so. But cuter somehow. Very much cuter and very, very in keeping somehow with the consistency of the entire world. Yeah. Like, it wasn't that far off. Yeah. That's the thing. The world has such a understandably approachable thing that the kid was able to grasp it and run with it. And it just kind of fits still. Yeah. And I love that. The idea of a Homestar Runner cartoon starting off with somebody having a picnic and nobody coming. Yeah, that works. Someone, a character walking in just to say, blah, (laughs) makes sense in this world. The fact that it's then everybody is also kind of the sort of punchline they do anyway. And I love that. And that's that's one of those delightful things. And then they go to an entire like encore of what they used to make with a strong bad email in there at the end. And this got to me because I went from being a kid who was watching this in middle school binging as many of these as i could on a slow internet connection for the time compared to what we've got now on our family computer watching the loading screen build up these flash cartoons for me to watch to being a recent college graduate working my day job and seeing this pop up on youtube <laughs> and feeling this same spark of joy at there being more of this and being able to just get hit with some of these references in a whole new way, because now I'm at a completely different level to interact and relate to what they're talking about. And it's like, Oh, this is just always here for me in that sense. And I loved that. Well, that is great because that, that is a little bit of the experience that I have sometimes making this podcast with you. In that by by having something I want to share with you, it causes me to go back to something that maybe I haven't seen in decades. And it's it's fewer years in your case here, but those are important years. And a person changes perhaps more in those years than any other time in their life. So you're getting some of that too. You're you're going back to something that meant something so much to you when you were younger. And you're re-experiencing that. And yet you're also experiencing new things because you're a different person when you go back to them. Yeah. So that's kind of cool because it's, that's an experience that, like I say, it's part of what I love about sharing stuff with you. It's fun to hear you have a similar experience with things that meant this much to you when you were in middle school. Exactly. That's the other reason I wanted to do that for this episode, Dad. For episode 101, as we go into the next hundred episodes we're going to make here. I wanted to kind of tell you that I absolutely get it because things like this let me, and this is why I'm so excited to keep making these with you and so happy because I completely understand what, what you're talking about when you're saying how, how much excitement you have to revisit something. I get it. And I love that. And thank you for letting me join you on that and to share with you the versions that do that for me. Well, that is very, very cool. That is a lot of fun. Thank you. And of course, this I also will mention, because I'm mentioning all the other things that this reference. If you want another example of how to short circuit my sense of humor, it's the it's the yep, yeppers, plate tectonics moment 
in this video <laughs> is an instant short circuit. You want to give me that? It's it's you know go left, left, and then turn right. Give me that break in pattern, and you will crack me. I've noticed that. Homestar. Yeah, what? You're in my house. Yep. Again. Yeah, boys. And you brought a boulder. Not me. Play tectonics. What are you doing in here, man? So, fun fact about me. But, with us having now talked to the end of my list of videos, and kind of about the way Homestar Runner did things as a whole, I get to bring the question to you, Dad. But it's a little weird to ask it. About revive, or no, binge or no binge, actually, is our first thing. Oh, binge. Binge. Yeah, binge. binge. Yeah, these are, these are designed to be binged. They welcome binging. They reward binging. Exactly. Yeah. They're not, they're not popcorn media. They're not like something like a TikTok or the like, you can just keep feeding yourself a couple of them. They're, they're light and airy and they're nothing. These are the popcorn chicken. <laughs> yes, of there's, videos. They're there's just as of, tasty, but there's more substance. There's to something them. meaty to them, <laughs> but they're still munchable like yeah, that. There are some where I, I do have to hit pause, either to laugh or just to think. What? What, what did he say? What just did? Did that just okay. sever your leg? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm I'm glad you're with me oh. on that, and that's kind of what I thought. That, that, that's possibly the easiest answer I've ever had in 101 episodes. Oh, good. Absolutely, binge this. Absolutely. But the question there becomes ro revive, reboot, or rest in peace. And I don't know how to ask that because it's kind of none and all. Yeah, it's sort of, um, it's not officially done. Yeah. It's not over. So I guess to the extent revive means keep making them. Yeah. I'll say revive. And we can, and that's the thing, like you saying reboot is weird for something whose literal basic form is to constantly change forms in parody of all these other things yeah it reboots itself four times within a single cartoon exactly so there's no le level there and i would never say rest in peace because no keep making i have love if it takes another five years before i see the next new video I'll be happy to see it, and I'll watch through everything else they have made another three times in the waiting process. But so it sounds like technically, on in our terms, we are saying revive, yeah, because we want more in the same continuity. Yes, and there is a shocking amount of continuity. There is a ridiculous <laughs> amount of continuity. There are times when, like, uh, so no joke, uh, in that latest episode. They do a joke uh, that um, that uh, the, the next April Fool's thing from four years ago, which isn't actually the most recent thing they've made. In that video, they do a joke with a newspaper showing an advertisement for the product uh, Strong Bad is making a joke about. File, file, file folder shaped vitamin shaped gum drop, uh, thumb drives. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes. Every single other thing on that newspaper page is a prop from an other episode. <laughs> the ridiculous chair in the corner, the references on the side, every inch of that is a callback, <laughs> which is wild. There is a ridiculous amount of continuity because if they make it once, they have it. Seeing something new in a Homestar Runner cartoon is just watching another arrow slip into their quiver that they will fire... <laughs> Whenever they want later. So I assume that file folder shaped vitamin shaped thumb drives are going to come back. Oh, I absolutely know something is going like someone is going to walk up to a computer and plug one of those in sometime <laughs> later. And it's not going to be referenced or noted or commented on. It's just an object that exists in the world. It's like playing Gmod. Where you just have this library of every object in all of these other video games you've played that you can <laughs> spawn in at random and do something with. But with, like, strange little vignette stories all throughout, so you never know what they're going to load in and use, and it's fun. <sighs> but I think that's the end of our episode. Okay, before we completely end, though, I have one last question. Mm-hmm. I showed you a small selection of some of my favorites, but I know you've seen some of their things other than the ones I showed you. Can you think of a favorite episode outside of these 
because there's a lot of them. Outside of these, that's tough because uh, Fisheye Lens was was definitely one of my favorites already. Okay. As was the the caffeine one, of course. Those two are probably my favorites, so I was delighted to see you include those in the list. Okay, that works. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if anyone messages me on Twitter, they're going to get it. They could get a random su suggestion of one that I like, and <laughs> it is pretty much just me using a randomizer for every video they've made. <laughs> ah, but in speaking of Twitter, uh, if you want to get a hold of us, uh, where can they find you, Dad? Oh, you can find me online mostly as by Matthew Porter. So I'm at by Matthew Porter. On Twitter, you can go to buymatthewporter.com, find links to whatever else I'm doing online. And Ian, where can people find you? I can be found on Twitter as Item Crafting, on Twitch as Item Crafting Live, and at itemcrafting.com. And you can find the podcast at www.immproject.com, and that's where you'll find links to all of our back episodes and any of the uh, places you can get in touch with us, like on Twitter, where we are. Uh, at IMMPcast, but you'll also find there links to our shop, to our Patreon, a contact page if you'd like to get in touch with us. And what's your favorite Homestar Runner episode? We would love to hear that. We would love to hear that. And we've got another new way to message us. Yes, we do. If you need to send us anything uh, by U.S. mail, you can reach us at IMMP at P.O. Box 271167, Littleton, Colorado. 80127. And in celebration of our 100th episode, we still have an offer where if you send us a self addressed stamped envelope to that P.O. box, we will send you back an IMMP sticker. Absolutely. You can get a sticker and put it on anything you like, as long as it's probably yours, I'd suggest. Don't put it on public property, but still. Yeah. And that's it for our episode. And come back in two weeks to hear Dad take back over the podcast and show me something from the 20th century. And in the meantime, um, watch a whole lot of Homestar Runner. You'll find it great. And then find something old to watch. <laughs>